It is September 8th, 2023. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. This is our first Friday after Labor Day. I actually devoted my full newsletter to uh, deplorable, deplorable, deplorables. Um, we kind of filled up the zone here. Uh, n- normally, Tim, I, I, I have this kind of, you know, if you have a lifetime deplorable rating, we don't include you in the weekly ratings, but I, I, I bent sense. the rules a little bit because you, you had to, how could you do a deplorables of the week without Jim Jordan and the fact that he just got slapped down by Fonnie Willis. How, how, how do you do it without, you know, the latest George Santos story or, and I'm, I'm sorry Tucker. that I keep, I, I, I keep coming back to Tommy Tuberville. I, you know, we've got to put him, you know, on the shelf. We've got to, you know, he's in the clubhouse and yet, you know, when don't you have want United any States- of those F slurs and their poems in our military, Charlie, don't want That's that. Right. Only oh. want men who can't read in the military. Well, you know, if, if literature breaks out among the ranks, just who knows what could happen? People start <laughs> reading, they start thinking, and, you know, Tommy Tuberville, I, you know, look, I mean, Tommy Tuberville as a coach probably realized, you know, the, the dangers of having football players read books and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's been consistent on, on all of that. So yeah, I'm guessing a couple of his players read a few more poems than him, but, you know, I don't know. Okay, so we, we, we have a little bit of, uh, of alignment of the stars here. Because uh, in in my deplorables of the week, I think my favorite item was um, the cool kid philosopher Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson, who both mm. got pooned by this guy named. Well, I, I don't even want to take it away from you because I, I was uh, you you just destroyed him with it with a tweet yesterday. This is this is the guy um, who is has the bombshell report that. <sighs> That Barack Obama was gay or whatever, and mm-hmm. and Tucker Carlson gave him airtime, and 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 I know that a lot of this is sort of Do we call it airtime if he's got fired from TV stream time. Yeah, okay, stream time. I thank you. I I I stand corrected here. You know, I I, I suppose you know part of me is like okay, it's same old same old Tucker Carlson. You know, is you know is a fire hose of bullshit, but. Even by these standards, putting this guy, giving this guy any credibility whatsoever. So, okay, I do do your thing because you just utterly dismantled all of this. It's, it, well, it's, a, ahead it's of, a great moment ahead of in curve. American uh, journalism. Thank you. We were ahead of the curve last Friday um, talking know. about how Can- when Candace Owens talked about this, all the this stuff yeah. bubbles up. This is why you have. This is why you know we do this. So you don't have to suffer through the right wing media. This stuff yeah. bubbles up, and that, and you think it might just be one person sending a weird tweet. It's not that. No, like they yeah. these narratives develop, and and the narrative du jour was was Obama being a secret gay, and uh, also doing crack smoking, um, yeah, and uh, and and the this that this story rolled out that Candace was talking about that we discussed last week you know, was a rehash, you know, for people who have no memory, for people who weren't alive in 2008 and the before times or who, you know, were going about their lives and not worrying about the end of our democracy who didn't pay attention that closely. This this was around in 2008 in the same fever swamp. So is this guy. Yeah. His name is Larry Sinclair. And actually, before I get into this, I just want to say, because some people are going to be like, why the fuck are you talking about this? And I just, I do think it's important to just point out. Tucker Carlson is is now on his live stream in the basement. But Ben Shapiro, who just jumps on this, is the biggest right wing podcaster. Right. Uh, there's 40 percent of the country that is engaging in this sort of stuff. And and like, uh, you know, I think we learned in 2016 what putting our head in the sand does and, and, and where you end up. So anyway, you, you got to you, people need to know how crazy these fuckers are or else, you know, who knows? We might end up with. The yeah, we, we, we tried that. Someday. Like, let, let's let's ignore them. Let's not give them yeah. oxygen. Let's pretend they don't exist. Uh, let's yeah. just treat and then all them of a sudden as, as they're clowns. like running the defense department and attempting a coup. So, you know, um, right. we, we, we need to at least like make sure people realize the extent of their clownitude. So this guy, Larry Sinclair, in 2008 came forward. With a rather salacious story that he that in 1999 um, he was in Chicago and um, uh, you know he was looking for a night of fun and he asked his limo driver um, you know if he might know a young gentleman that might be interested in uh, you know maybe procuring his wares and having a night of of debauched drugs and you know love making and. Um, and uh, the uh, supposedly this this limo driver knew exactly the right person for this, sure. and he called up a local state senator uh, named uh, Barack Obama, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and so they drove from his comfort in hotel down to some lounge downtown. The guy can't remember the lounge's name. And outside yeah. the lounge was a strapping young uh, man, uh, you know, skinny guy with a weird name. And uh, and he was like he was down to, you know, he was down to clown. And uh, and so that and then it started from there. And then they had two nights of doing crack together, smoking crack, um, oral sex. Oral sex in the limo, oh, went back okay. to the hotel. He has this very long story that he tells. And so uh, he has this press conference in 2008 where he was going to share this. And, um, you know, the right wing media at the time, which was, you know, far less robust than it is now, was all was into it, though. The alternative mm-hmm. one, Fox, not Fox, but the mm-hmm. online right wing media. And he, and he has this press conference where he rambles and rambles. Our friend Dave Weigel, who's been on this podcast, was there. Mm-hmm. And at the mm-hmm. end of the press conference, he gets arrested. <laughs> by Larry D.C. Sinclair Metropolitan Police. Right, right. Yeah, Larry Sinclair gets arrested by D.C. Metropolitan Police. Why did he get arrested? Well, he had a warrant out for his arrest in Delaware. Uh, you come to find out, um, Ben Smith reported on this in Politico, that uh, Larry Sinclair has a lifetime as a con man and a fraudster. He, has, uh, he had 16 years in jail in Colorado for fraud and credit card charges. Uh, he had theft and forging a check in Florida, theft in Delaware, Colorado records list him with 13 aliases, Very including incredible. Larry, Vizcara, Avia, yeah. Mohammed, whatever. He lied to courts. Uh, in four years prior to that press conference, he he said he couldn't appear in Pueblo, Colorado on another theft charge because he had, it was disabled with a severe spine injury and terminally ill. Somehow he, he miraculously uh, rose like Lazarus and was able to walk into the press club in 2008. Uh, in after that, uh, the White House, the website WhiteHouse.gov offered or WhiteHouse.com, excuse me, offered to pay him a hundred thousand dollars if he passed a lie detector test verifying these claims. He took the test and failed it. I, I, this is a preposterous. If you look at this man, yeah. the barstool sports guy. Uh, um, uh, it was not exactly, you know, Mr. Discretion. Um, all right. He was like, I met this person and Tucker's cause I was also doing an interview with Tucker the same day. And it, he's the least credible person I've ever met in my life. I give him a 0.0% chance of, of telling a true story. If you just look at him, I don't want to be stereotypical, but he looks like the, the kind of person that would tell you anything that you need to hear for one more bump of cocaine. Okay. I mean, that's See, just exactly it, 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 how he it, reads. It, 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 Right. Any journalist, any newsroom knows guys like this who wander in, they've got the story and you look at them, you do a little bit of you, you spend about 15 seconds doing a background check and you realize this guy's a nut. We don't even want him around. We're not going to talk to him. <laughs> Tucker Carlson, despite everything that you just mentioned, despite this massive, you know, I mean, all of all of the details of, that show that this guy's a complete fraud. Which we're all known. It's a whole interview, now, obviously. Today. Been out there for okay, fifteen ben, years. Yeah. So, so here's here's the the tweet that got my uh, my attention. So Ben <laughs> Shapiro, um, you know, the cool kid philosopher, um, but a major influence, destroyer of bad arguments. New York right. Times. Uh, uh, it tweets out Siri- serious question after watching Tucker Carlson's interview with Larry Sinclair. Why are his allegations significantly less credible than those of, say, E. Jean Carroll or Christine Blasey Ford? To which you responded, Larry Sinclair had fraud charges in two states, went to jail in three, filed an affidavit 20 years ago saying he couldn't stand trial because he was terminally ill, seems to be alive now. Colorado records listed with 13 aliases, and he failed a polygraph test over these claims. Other serious questions. So, I mean, this is, I'm, people like, you yeah. need to understand that, I mean, there, there are lies and there are bullshit, but then there's Tucker Carlson taking this guy and saying, you know, you know, I am so desperate. I am so thirsty for attention that I'm going to throw this guy up. And Ben Shapiro's serious question, serious questions. Why would he be less credible than E. Jean Carroll, who was, by the way, found credible by a federal jury and judge, etc. Yeah. Not only was E. Jean Carroll found credible by a federal jury, but E. Jean Carroll, at her defamation trial, uh, in which the jury found that Donald Trump had raped her, raped her. provided 11 witnesses. She provided yeah. 11 witnesses at this trial. I, I, you know, this is, you know, can I offer another reason, Ben Shapiro, why E. Jean Carroll is more credible than this lying, uh, fraudulent crackhead? 
Uh, yeah. How about the 11 witnesses? That's what happened. When you ha make an accusation like this, yeah. you bring corroborating evidence. You bring a diary. You bring the friend that you told in real time. You bring something. Sinclair had nothing. He, he, yeah, didn't, okay, so, he, didn't so serious, he couldn't so even serious. remember the fucking name of the place where they met. Okay, so serious question, though. Serious question. Y you would think that Tucker Carlson has some residual concern for his credibility, or is that naive? I mean, what? I don't think How so. does this help him? How does this advance any cause that he wants other than I'm going to do something outrageous. I'm going to see what shit I can throw against the wall and get away with. I mean, there is part of me that thinks that Tucker Carlson's kind of in the mode now saying, you know, it's like, how far can I push it? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? Is it, are there, are, will there be any consequences? Well, he's out on his ass at Fox News. He's off in some corner of Elon Musk's basement now. And but this is holy crap. I mean, even I Elon Musk it. was saying, yeah, this doesn't sound like it's real to me. Yeah, I think that's it. I think it's he wants to see what he can get away with. I think that he thinks it's a big game now. I, you know, I, it's hard, far be it for me to psychoanalyze Tucker, but I think that he gets joy out of this and that he thinks it's funny he thinks it's funny for people's hair to be on yeah. fire and he thinks it's funny to you know do this sort of thing I, this story is ridiculous I, you know i didn't even get into the fact that larry in this interview i'm watching he talks about how barack obama was also uh, uh, involved in some murder of another of a gay yeah. choir director at his church because they might have had an affair and like tucker doesn't ask any of the obvious follow-up questions tucker's yeah. not an idiot he used to be a talented magazine writer i just i reread right. his 1999 bush profile the other day it's really well done actually i you know this is not a moron like he he knows how to yeah. ask which makes it which questions. makes it actually worse right i mean it makes yeah, it absolutely. worse that he knows what he is doing he knows that he is engaging in defamation he knows that barack obama is not going to be able to sue him for all this but but look at look in our defense for for spending time talking about this because you know that we're going to get a little bit of you know in the comments section people saying you know Tim and Charlie, why are you even talking about this? Then don't be surprised um, in the next couple of months when you see a poll showing that 40% of Americans actually believe that Barack Obama did blank, 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 because yeah. this is the world we live in. OK, you have so, to debunk it and give people something to push back. on. Is this a, is this yes. a silver bullet? No, but ignoring it's not a silver bullet. I, I, I swear to God, I was not. I sent that tweet that you just uh, read. Yeah. And then I was like, OK, I'm done with this. And then, nope. you know, you said in Slack, you need to write an article. And I you thought, gotta myself, I got to do it. Write an article yeah. about this. It's like this fucking guy, like really. And then the, the two minutes later, I pop over to Instagram, stall a little minute, as people do look through my stories. And there it is, like literally one of the first stories I clicked on is somebody that's not political, old friend, and, and you know, it has a little thing that's kind of cheeky, but kind of serious. It's like, so Barack did, you know, gay sex and crack, yeah. huh? Yeah. And I'm like, this is how things happen. This is how this stuff gets out. This is how conspiracies spread. And so like for people like that, you have to give them a link that's like, no, okay, now I can send this to you. And is that going to convince the people in the deep MAGA world? No. That is going to convince that guy on Instagram, right? Who maybe was a little bit confused. And does it really matter? I guess, I guess not. But I, I think that this is part of a broader project, the Flood the Zone with Shit project that, that Steve Bannon said. That's like, mm -hmm. we are corrupted. You know, we are going to advance these lies. We are going to advance these bigoted conspiracies and corruption. And as part of the strategy for that is we're going to bring everybody else down with us. We're going to smear them. Right. And so then you can't judge us. You can't judge Tucker on his lies and conspiracies and Donald Trump's. If 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 Barack Obama was hiding his secret life as a gay lover and, and crack addict, then how could you judge Donald Trump for his rapes and his, you know, coup, right? That is the strategy here. So it has to be pushed down. It I, I, no, I, pushed I, down. I agree with you completely. I guess the question is whether you can push back and push down on it anymore. Because I remember, I mean, we've, we've talked about this. I remember back in the before times when you would get a crazy crazy conspiracy theory like this and somebody would, would forward it and you would write back to them and saying, OK, do you understand where this comes from? Here's why it's not true. I would send them all the information about Larry Sinclair's frauds and aliases yeah. and, and arrests and everything. And they would say, OK, you know, thanks. I'm, I'm not going to you know forward Uncle Otto's emails like this anymore. But since 2016, when you do that, people go, well, you know, why am I going to believe anything from the Washington Post? Or, yeah, he was convicted by the deep state in Colorado. It becomes irrefutable. I mean, and this, this is this is right. the world that Tucker has helped create and in, in which he thinks he flourishes, which is that 
He's in these hermetically sealed alternative reality silos and you just can't break in. And th this may be an example of it, but I do think you're right. We have to push back against all. I do want to say it's sad. My final yeah. comment about this is sad. I think Tucker's life is sad. And I think he's projecting. He said that he, <clears throat> he randomly went off on Bill Crystal recently. And nope. he was like, can you imagine what a dinner party is like at Bill Crystal's house? It has to have, there has to be no joy there. Like these people are joyless, these establishment types. And to me, that felt I like a know. confession. Yeah, you've never been invited to Bill's house, me neither. No. Um, uh, the, but it felt like a confession. I, I right? It's like th these. It seems like somebody that I I think would never admit it, but thrived on being invited to write profiles about George W. Bush for Talk Magazine, and now is pushed out to the edges with these weird freaks, and and. I think he's probably somewhere deep inside his soul a little unhappy with himself because this feels sad. The, well, the, it, I was it, watching it, the interview. It, it seems sad. Yeah. It, it, it does feel sad. And, and again, you're, you're Tucker Carlson. You can do anything and yet you choose to do right. this. By the way, speaking of sad, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, you know, Elon Musk, it, it feels like it's uh, an old story that he's, you know, he has destroyed Twitter or whatever we're supposed to call it these days, you know, Exeter or whatever. Um, but, the, you know, this last week, uh, it has just been the, I, I mean, where, where, do, where do you start? You know, the fact that he's pushing these anti-Semitic tropes about the uh, Anti-Defamation League, that he's, you know, pushing this this idea that, you know, Jews complaining about anti-Semitism causes more anti-Semitism, you know, that tired old thing. I mean, he's, you know, here's the guy that, that opened up uh, Twitter to, to Nazis and everything, and he's pushing out these things. And yet that's not the worst thing he did this week. N now, mm -hmm. basically, he's acknowledging that that he shut off the Starlink communications to the Ukrainians when they were trying to disable the the Russian fleet, the Russian fleet that that fired missiles that have killed civilians and children and bombed cities and everything. And, uh, you know, this is in the new biography of, of Elon Musk. But, you know, Elon Musk is not just a clown. Elon Musk is somebody that became a willing ally of the Russians and cut the Ukrainians off at the knees. And there are some pretty significant issues here. You know, what role does Elon Musk, this fucking narcissistic crackpot, play in national security and issues of war and peace here? Yeah, the not, Washington Post article. This is not article, a joke. Yeah. No, it isn't. And the, and the, um, Excerpt was from was from Walter Isaacson's book, which yeah. I'm excited to read. And, and yeah. Walter is uh, is really un unbelievably talented. Yeah. Uh, and the story is kind of crazy. He's like watching this Arch Manning football game here, right down the street from my house in uh, in New Orleans. And like Elon's calling him, talking about how he's going to shut off the Ukrainians. And it's just like, I, what a crazy scene, you know, for starters to write about um, and to think that 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 this is where we are as a society, where like the Ukrainians are begging Elon to keep these uh, Starling things open. And uh, working, and and t though to me reading the story, my my big takeaway is like it was really a mistake for everybody to let it get this far, right? Like I, th there's yeah. Boeing does not get to have a setting on their plane when you contract with Boeing that says, oh, we're going to turn off the plane and may, we're going to automatically turn this plane around if you get over Russian airspace. Like that's not how it works. Like when you contract with a government. The government is in charge of diplomacy, of military operations. You are providing a service. Right. And, and I think that the Ukrainians, uh, obviously, they're in desperate times. And it seems like Elon really did help them at the start. But you get in bed with this mercurial figure. And at some point, I guess there was an offer for the U.S. to pay. And Elon spitefully kind of said no. And it was really at that point where... I don't, I don't know what needed to happen. A fucking summit at Elon's place in Austin with Tony Blinken and a Ukrainian official. I'm not sure, but you needed to get to a place where it's like, no, this guy doesn't get to decide, right? Like either he's going to contract you with us movie, and provide this. But if you were making a movie, if you were writing a movie, you know, about this dysfunctional world where, yeah. you know, this, this erratic billionaire is sitting there with top government officials making these life and death decisions, you know, somebody would say this is totally implausible. There's no way that the U.S. Right. government, the Ukrainian government would be held hostage by this, you know, rich guy. I mean, Iron Man. It's, I mean, the, it's literally the, the, out of Iron Man. Ju just a, a reminder that we, we actually do kind of live in an oligarchy, and, but, but, but the worst, dumbest oligarchy you can imagine. Yeah. 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 I mean, somebody was pointing out, and maybe this is true, that like there's that 
Malaysian, and this is another reason why we got to monitor the crazy shit. Like, there's some, there's this Malaysian influencer, Ian Miles Shong. And if you don't know about him, yeah, God oh, bless yeah. you. Don't right. learn it. Don't learn yeah. another thing about him after this. But, but he is this like far right MAGA type, but he doesn't even live in America. But somehow he he got a Twitter following, and he, and Elon replies to him all the time. And he was he initially people think suggested to Elon via tweet. That like he shut the, these things down. He also has a Russia Today article, right? So like all of this stuff is intertwined, right? And and I, this is just again why like they, they needed to have cut a actual military, you know, a, a, um, contracting agreement, or or cut this guy off. I, I, the, the, this situation is fucking nuts. Otherwise. So another like bottom story of the day. I want to get to the more important stories of the day, but oh, but 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 you slacked me this this story about George okay. Santos. I kind of thought we were done with George Santos, but it. it I, I just it, started reading this and laughing in bed this morning, and I was just like, we might just want to just give people a little taste. So it it, it turns out that there was what, what do they call this thing? Like a vulnerability report, vulnerability right? Study, they, yeah. they, 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 so the campaigns commission a basically opera research on themselves to figure out, okay, what's yep. the worst thing somebody can say about me, right? I mean, yeah, you know, right. so CBS News got their hands on this vulnerability report for George Santos. This was by his his own campaign, and this was widely circulated, and people like Elise Stefanik, who eventually endorsed and campaigned for George Santos, knew about this. I mean, she saw this. And so let me see if I can do a little bit of a reading of, of the top things. Um, th again, this is from the Santos campaign itself um, before he was elected, saying one victim of the company where Santos worked was an elderly woman living on Social Security who says she was told that if Donald Trump were elected, the stocks and bonds she was invested in would plummet. Santos worked for a Turkish based company with a litany of customer complaints and scam allegations. The complaints continue while Santos worked there. Santos says his professional experience is working in finance and helping wealth grow, but his personal financial disclosure filed with the clerk of the house shows no personal investments or assets. Uh, then it goes on and talks about Santos' driver's license is suspended in Florida. Santos has had multiple. He can't drive in Florida. Him. <laughs> Santos is running for office in New York, but he requested his new company, but he, he registered his new company in Florida. Uh, Santos says he is socially liberal and to be clear, I am no right winger. And it goes on to uh, question details about his marriage and things like that. It's just, but it's all laid out here. And I love the, the, the line. marriage one was pretty good. Yeah. The marriage one was pretty good. We just have to do this one. While married to uh, a woman, I don't, I can't pronounce her name. Social media posts indicate Santos dated and lived with a man who was an illegal immigrant. The man later said he was fearful of being deported once Trump got elected. And then Santos began dating his current partner while he was also still married to Vieira. I liked that. And my other favorite one that you didn't mention was that he said uh, he criticized the people storming the Capitol. The, the campaign team was worried about that one. They were like, "That might, that might, that might come back to hurt us in the primary." I mean, he can't drive in Florida. He's secretly dating an illegal immigrant while married a man while married to a woman. His whole career is a lie and a Ponzi scheme. And Elise Stefanik is like, "That's my fucking guy." Yeah, that's it. That's that's my yeah, so let, let's put him in the Congress of the United States. Let's let's go ahead and and, and support him. But of course, this is the Biden regime deep state smear. Of an American, but wait, wait, no, it's his own campaign. It comes from his own campaign. Speaking of your own campaign and self-inflicted wounds, um, Tim, you were also ahead of the, uh, the the curve with a big piece about the complete uselessness of super PACs. Uh, they burn through, you know, tens of millions of dollars without moving anything, accomplishing anything. I mean, really, it's quite extraordinary that that you have these these consultants that, that are running the super PACs and keep asking for more money and they spend these just God awful amounts of money, accomplish nothing and just keep, you know, stay in business. But now there's uh, there's more reporting that, uh, that Ron DeSantis is disappointed in his super PAC. He was apoplectic mm. about the release of the memo. So your advice has been in, do donors, instead of giving to these super PACs, why don't you just take your money and like set it on fire or like give it to yeah. some homeless people or what? Right. Give it to somebody. I, so this is now, uh, just to be clear, I, I think that there are certain situations where certain 
like kind of targeted packs and stuff that do certain things, motivate groups for various things, you know, reach one to two percent of voters on the margins in a general election. I, yeah. I do think that matters. It's these candidate packs. We learned in 2016. I was there with Jeb yeah. where we had this hugely funded pack. And we had a, you know, and the campaign didn't have any money and the candidate, you know, I love Jeb, great one on one, but, you know, dynamism on stage wasn't like his strength. Right. So really, we already did this. Yeah, really. I know. Um, We already did this eight years ago. And the DeSantis campaign is like, let's set up the same program. Yeah. As Jeb had, but actually a little worse because Jeb at least had Mike Murphy, who he trusted on right. the Super PAC and they had known for 20 years. We're going to hire this guy that is just a total, you know, uh, uh, stranger, right? But has a good, re- uh, a good reputation. We're, we're going to hire somebody. Yeah, Jeff Rowe. Yeah. And we're going to put him over there where it's going to be illegal to talk to him. We're going to give him all the money and let him come up with a strategy. And the campaign is just going to, like, and, and Ron is just going to try to win on the force of his personality. I mean, the whole setup was <laughs> preposterous from the start. And as I go in deep detail, I have a long rant about this that mm-hmm. is maybe more for an insider's podcast than this one. In the, in the, in the article, the, the short of it is like, these things maybe work in lower level races, but in presidential races, it just, it defies obvious logic, right? It's like Donald Trump is the, is a brand that all these voters know they, they they have a deeply held view on him one way or the other maybe some of them are in the cult maybe some of them don't like him maybe some of them like him but are open to moving on but they all have deeply held beliefs about him running a 30 second tv ad or, or having a stranger knock on your door is not going to change your mind about donald trump and if you're going to do that the 30 second tv ad needs to be you know a fucking rip it off his face you know it needs to be a new piece of information something to change things up a generic cookie cutter ad it was like it obviously isn't going to work in this situation you know the analogy i gave in the article is like imagine if you're rc cola and you, you're the, you're a, mark, a marketing guru. You're the Jeff Rowe of cola selling. And you go to the you go to the investors, and you're like, if you give me fifty million, mm-hmm. I'm going to run some ads in Iowa that say RC Cola is great, and not mention Coke. And then I'm going to send people to people's doors, and I'm going to knock on them and say, hey, you should try RC Cola instead of Coke. And then at the end of that, RC Cola is going to be the number one soda. Coke's mm-hmm. going to be gone. We're going to pass them. The p- investors would look at you like you're insane. They'd be like, that's fucking, like, that's not going right. to work. And why would that work in this situation then? Um, so the whole thing is just preposterous. And there's this other political story this morning that 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 really got ground my gears, Charlie. It was, uh, they went to, they Jeff Rowe let people into their headquarters and, 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 and they let the reporter meet, a uh, good reporter, Sasha Eisenberg, meet their data scientists. And the data scientists are like, we've been testing. We tested one ad in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and another ad in Ottumwa, Iowa. We tested mail in this part of New Hampshire. We tested text messages in the other part of New Hampshire. And we discovered if, if we do more text messages in this one ad instead of the other ad, then 6% of our target voting audience will be more likely to vote Science. for Ron. Science. And I'm like, I'm going, I'm reading this article and I'm like, you're losing by 40. You're losing by 40. Okay. A 6% increase in favorability. I, a, I think this is kind of voodoo science to begin with, but that's up for another topic. But even if you are right, it's like, you need to fucking change up the game. You need to go attack Donald Trump. You got to do something. You have a zero of a candidate who's lost 14%. Well, you've spent t- tens of millions of dollars from rich people. And, and and now you're trying, you're bragging to Politico that you can move things 6% on the margins. And people are still giving this guy money. Give me your money. Tell me. Dude, like I, I, I'll tell you what to do with your money. You know, we'll support local nonprofit organizations. You know, we'll have a, a, a foreign exchange program to bring more young French boys to Wisconsin. I, we'll do things that are useful. We'll help, you know, underhoused people yeah. in, 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 in northern Wisconsin. Where, where can we spend this money instead of on Jeff Rose Beach houses? I wish people would pay attention to you. You know, I mean, there there are, of course, you know, the professional scammers out there who will continue to, you know, try to sell this. And and, and then there are people who are, you know, you know, some of the bad ideas are driven by donors. And this is kind of a, a digression because as as you were talking, I was thinking back to um, a conversation I was I was part of reluctantly in, in the before times where people were talking about one of the campaigns we were having here in Wisconsin. We used to have a campaign like every month. Remember, there was a period when we were recalling and doing mm-hmm. all kinds of things yeah. here. And 
the various ideas for you know motivating voters or turning out voters. And uh, there was a an older guy who was uh, a a major donor who said, um, "Well, let me tell you my idea. My idea is we need to have more billboards." Mm. And then he pulls out this little pro thing and he with pictures of billboards that he had put in various locations around the community. And it was like, I paid for these and look at these and everybody. No one's going to say, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, what a waste of money. It's like yard signs or like handing out matchbooks or something like that. It's just, it is, you know, and yet because he was a donor, everybody was like, that's really a good idea. You yeah. know, where else can we where else can we put uh where else can we put these 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 billboards? Yeah. But okay, I so gotta tell you, Charlie, if if, yeah. if 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 Ron DeSantis used all the money to buy every billboard in America and have yeah. them all say Donald Trump didn't build the wall, he's a pussy. I, I that probably would have been a better use of their fifty million dollars. I'm not I'm it's, not it's, sure no, 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 Ron DeSantis, you're, you're, but it couldn't have been any worse than what these gurus have been no. doing with the money. But of course, this is you know this is Ron Ron DeSantis is Ron DeSantis, and that's not going to change. Okay, so this week I. And I told you before we started this that I was I was bored talking about the polls and various things. But I think, you know, at the end of the week, we have to talk about it. this was and you tell me whether you, you think I'm wrong about this. This was the week of the Democratic panic about Joe Biden, um, no. you know, probably a rather um, significant overreaction to a couple of polls. The CNN poll, the Wall Street Journal poll showing that Donald Trump is actually leading Joe Biden, that Joe Biden is just, you know, is uh, not doing well with non-white voters. Uh and that when Democratic voters are asked, you know, what are, what are you concerned about? Like overwhelmingly, like I just off the charts, mm -hmm. the age issue. And and I know wow. that there's this big back and forth. Stop talking about the age really? issue, okay? The he's, age he's old. Issue. He, he's getting okay. So, um, but and and you had a interesting back and forth with um, the the poker guru, formerly known as Nate Silver, uh, about about all of this. So, give me your take on this because. Again, I understand people saying stop talking about it, but it is the you know it is the giant pink dirigible in the room that you can't have a conversation with voters without bringing up. So, Tim, talk to me about yeah. Joe Biden's um, age. Yeah, I've, I, we hear your we get the comments, I get the yeah. emails, I, mm -hmm. I get the replies on Twitter and on threads. Mm -hmm. I understand people don't want to hear about the age thing, uh, Joe Biden supporters, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, of which of which I count myself. Um, but the, the CNN poll was not a poll of like podcasters and what you're worried about. It was right. the number one issue by far that Joe Biden voters were cared about, right. care about. Right. And so on a political podcast, it's kind of, you know, you're kind of not doing your job if you don't talk about the thing, the top yeah. thing by far that voters care about. Uh, it's, it right. sort of would be like, what would be the point? It would be like turning into a Denver Broncos podcast and, and having them never mention the fact that the quarterback, Russell Wilson, isn't any good anymore. Like, it's kind of a big problem for the team. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it is something you have to discuss. Um, uh, the other thing, though, on that point about why we discuss it so much that I did want to just clarify, I was thinking about it this week. So people are like, why don't you talk about Trump's age more? Yeah. And do you, do, you, do you want me to tell you my answer to that, Charlie? Yeah. Because I want Donald Trump to die. I hope Donald Trump dies. I'm not worried about Donald Trump dying. That would be the best fucking thing. So I, I so I'm not concerned oh. about that. I'm not concerned about. It, so I, I don't need to talk about it that you much because I'm not it. Oh, like wow. I'm talking about things that I'm concerned about. I did. I said it out loud. I, I, that would be great. So so I, I you know yeah he's also old. But like, there's not a lot of sturm and drag among the among the pro democracy crowd about like what would happen if Donald Trump fell over. Like that would be awesome. So fingers crossed on that front. But there is some concerns about what can you do to mitigate the issues about Joe Biden's age. And so maybe that's why there's a disproportionate conversation. But it's true that they're both old. I discussed both. I had my Snapchat show. You can watch it this week. It's about our yeah. gerontocracy. And, uh, and and I give more detailed thoughts on this on this on that. Okay. Uh, so really let me, quick let me, on Nate the, Silver. Yeah. Just, yeah. No, no, no. Can I get this uh, way in on you wanting yeah, uh, Donald Trump to die? Because I wanted to... Um, distance myself and associate myself in, in some ways with, with all of this that okay. I would rather That's say, fine. okay, yes, he's 77 and clearly, you know, uh, has, has cognitive issues. You know, yes, there's, there's no question about it, yeah. but with, you look at, you, you look at Donald Trump and it's like, he's a crook. 
He's a seditionist. He is one of the most fundamentally odious figures ever to be in American politics. And he's oh, by the way, he's also, he's, all, yes, he's a big, and, and by the way, he's 77. It, it, it's like he's in the list of awfulnesses, it's not in the top 10 because there's so much else. It's like you look at Donald Trump and if you're going, you know, he's looking kind of wrinkly. It's like, no, no, no. The point is he's, he's, he's a would-be autocrat. Yeah. He is a serial liar. He is, yeah. he is a man, he's a man with the, with the emotional maturity of a nine-year-old. He is, I mean, whatever you want to say about him, you know, all of that I think is, comes before this. You look at, at, you at Joe Biden and, extending and unfortunately remarks. because, yeah. okay, I mean, you look at Joe Biden and you're going, oh, okay, I, I agree with him. I mean, the voters, the, the, the Biden yeah. voters, I agree with him on, you know, policies. I agree with him on this. I, you know, you know, share these yeah. values, but I'm really worried that he looks like he's a hundred years old. So, so it is, it is different. It's because that yeah. that's a more prominent thing because there's not a lot of other baggage here, but of yeah. course, um, I do want to associate myself saying that, um, um, that, uh, I, I do find myself, you know, hoping occasionally for an errant meteorite. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry. Back it to would be so nice. Over. I just, that's all I'm saying. It'd be nice. Just, um, just, uh, just, and I, it's, I can't really think of any person, other person who I feel that way about. So it's not like I'm just sending a lot of people into the sun, just one orange person. Um, I've just wrote finally on Nate Silver. I, I cause I'm sick of talking about this. Like, yeah. I, I, the the whole thing is just the media and the meta media criticism narrative stuff is just really insane to me. It's like, oh, our listeners are like everyone, you know, on uh, any Joe Biden supporter is like, you, all anybody can talk about is the a is the age issue. All Donald Trump supporters talk about is how old yeah. Joe Biden is. It's everywhere. It's all yeah. they talk about. And then there's this small class of anti anti Trumpers, you know, the contrarian class, and they're and they somehow have decided that like the media doesn't talk about this and are. are and that it's the narrative is the media is trying to protect Joe Biden by not mentioning his age. Yeah. And Nate was advancing this theory this week. And on Twitter, I just had to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Do you turn on the TV ever? Like, are you, you're just playing poker stars all day online. That's fine. But then don't just make these vast claims, but they're stubborn. They're, 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 these stubborn, egomaniacal contrarians can't just be like, you know what, Tim, you're, you're right. There have been a lot. People do talk about this. That was a mistake. I miss there, takes. There's, I there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of coverage of it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you wanted to talk about this new Saudi deal. I, yeah, I feel I'm a rant going on about the Saudi deal. I feel like this is Tell the me. Tim rant which, which Saudi like deal are we talking about? Like, 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 okay, like, give, like, give people the background of it, what we're talking about. Yeah, I don't know. You know, a lot, some weeks it's kind of like Charlie's ranting and we have like a repartee going. I think this week you're just like, you just want to wind me up and let me go, um, which I, which is fine. Yeah, I, I like that's, I like, that's I like my, ranting. That, that, was, that, was my, that was my game plan this week. Yeah, that was your notes this morning. Wind him up, that's let him it. go. Okay, Sally. Yep. Yep. So, so, yep. We, so obviously the Abraham Accords, which were these diplomatic deals um, that were negotiated during the Trump era between Israel and other, um, other Gulf states. Saudi was not one of them. <clears throat> The Biden administration is now trying to expand on this with a mega Saudi deal that is that does not just include diplomatic relations with Israel, but also on the table. We, I, you know, this is not finalized. We don't exactly know all the details about yes. So this is all reporting via leaks, etc. But also on the table is allowing Saudi to develop a nuclear program and a security guarantee uh, that is not in the same level of NATO. You know, but as some, uh, you know, again, not all the details are out, so we don't exactly know what it would be. But, but you know, some junior version, JV version of of the NATO security guarantee for that American backed, not not Israeli backed, uh, with for Saudi. And this is fucking mm. insane. This is madness. And I, I don't end up, but and the Biden administration seems to be for this. Lindsey Graham is for this, and. Uh, uh, Jared Kushner is for this, and MBS is well, for course. this. And I, I just, I am, I, I'm, what's that? Yeah, yes. And I'm I mean, very, of course, Jared's for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course, Jared's for this. Yeah. But uh, I'm just, that's mm -hmm. concerning to me just on anything that has that little trio of Lindsay, Jared, and MBS all excited it has me worried uh, to begin yeah. with. The Biden is, I, the Biden is, another, this, another, I, act, another one of the axes, an axis of, uh, of, of assholes again. <laughs> another axis of evil. Yeah. So I just yeah. don't know. Like, 
I, it doesn't seem like there are a lot of voices speaking out about this, about about concerns about this. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've I've I have been reaching out to some folks in the Hill that I'm, I want to do something about this next week. Um, with other people who are concerned about this, elected officials, not just podcast ranters like me. But I, just to put a finer point on this, like, I don't, yeah. you know, in the past, I understood that sometimes, you know, you got to make a deal with the devil over oil prices. And, you know, Saudi, uh, you know, has always had, you know, yeah. a, a pretty questionable regime when it comes to morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't just let the enemy per be right. perfectly the enemy of the real good on politique. human rights stuff. I, mm -hmm. I, real politics. I get mm -hmm. all that. MBS is a madman. Like they, they murdered somebody over a errant tweet uh, uh, the, over sometime over the past two weeks. He killed a journalist. Like he is trying to use his largesse to to influence, the, you know, the, to get his like grubby hands into the Western world in a lot of different well, ways. And it's working. He tried to, it's working. And it's working. Yeah. He yeah. tried to murder, not just the order Khashoggi. It isn't just Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. He tried to murder, you know, one of his former rivals who was exiled to Canada in Canada. He sent a kill yeah. squad to Canada. They got, they got, um, you know, they got waylaid. There's a big 60 minutes piece on this. So like this guy is not, is, is unstable. He is not a friend. It is not like dealing with a king that, you no. know, maybe they have some social policies, some anti-gay policies I don't like, it's the, but that they're generally rational. But it's not like that. Why is this, this guy is a yeah, lunatic. Okay. okay. But why is this happening? It's not 1975 anymore. He doesn't have us by, you know, by the short hairs when it comes to oil. I mean, we, you know, I mean, yes, he's got a lot of money, but there's a lot of money in the world. What is the, what is the attraction here? Why do the we have to I can understand to it? Yeah, the best I understand it is that there's, you know, there is the oil side of this. Yeah, uh, and and there's concerns about gas prices. Right, I right. get that though. I don't trust. I wouldn't trust MBS as far as you could throw him. You sign this deal, he's still going to want Trump in there, no matter how absolutely sweetheart of a deal right, you give right. him. He's still going to prefer Trump and Kushner. Right, and so uh, you know he's already shutting down. Uh, uh, you know, the amount of oil production that's being pushed out of the Middle East. So gas prices are already yeah. going up because of that. Anyway, so so uh, that part doesn't make sense to me. Then there is another, you know, kind of the gray beards, the old wise men of, yeah. of, you know, national security apparatus that would argue, and maybe we should have Eric Adelman or somebody smarter than me yeah. on to talk about this, but like, you know, this would be a big step in peace in the Middle East and 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 it would, you know, reduce risks that, that there's a blow up in the Middle East if there are more agreements between, you know, the Gulf countries and 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 Israel and it also isolates Iran more. There's some other well, th that, that seems to be that 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 would be the best uh, explanation that somehow that yeah. you use this to triangulate against Iran, that that you yeah. want to isolate sure. them. And so you're always playing those two poles off against one another. Yeah. That seems like the only really yeah, sure. most. That seems and like that, the though, most plausible. to me is, yeah. But that to me is is more plausible when it's when it was like you go back twenty years and you had you know Ahmadinejad right. you know right. versus kind of a pliant king of Saudi that you know didn't have global aspirations. Like, are, are we sure that the Iranian regime and Saudi regime are materially different right now? I, I, I guess like on the margins and, and we have a longer ties to Saudi. So I, you know, people are going to come on here and be like, Tim, what are you talking about? Obviously, Iran, Iran's terrible. This is not a defense of Iran, but it's just like MBS is fucking awful. He is awful yeah. and he is dangerous and he is untrustworthy. And it is, it makes me very uncomfortable. So that's about okay. About this. Okay, so let, let, let's 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 get back to uh, let's get back to domestic uh, politics and some rank punditry here. Okay. Okay. Um, because I, I do think there's always that temptation to overanalyze, um, uh, you know, the the various blips in the presidential race, and of course, I'm going to succumb to sure. those temptations. Is Vivek yeah. over? And I'm I'm, I'm 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 saying this because he had a really genuinely shitty week. I mean, just one oh, no. bad interview after another. There's no indication that his debate performance has transformed his prospects. It, it feels as if that whole glow lasted about, you know, three or four days. And then he went out and people realized he has kind of a smarmy, uh, you know, dishonest, disingenuous yeah. bullshitter. 
So is, is was he, he ever under? Is the question? I, like, I, was he ever actually running for president, wow. or is he just trying Very to cement point. himself as a future MAGA star? And has he hurt himself with that? Maybe a little bit. Maybe he's over. I think he definitely's no. overshot. I mean, Mehdi Hassan just absolutely annihilated that was him. Like, it's kind that of the was. type of thing that even a MAGA person watching this has to be like, bro, like, how did you not come better prepared for this? Um, and so, I, so I do think he's hurt himself a little bit this week. I got to tell you, I would love, just like the political nerd in me, the political dork scientist in me would love for that thing I was wishing about earlier to have happened. Mm -hmm. And for us to just have to look at what a Vivek uh, DeSantis Haley race would look like, because I think that tells us a lot about the future of the party. Yeah. And I just, I'm not convinced that Vivek's uh, week was bad enough that that would that would that would eliminate him in that fantasy scenario. Okay, in that because fantasy I just scenario. I really do I really do think there's like about a third of the party that's that's would want somebody like Vivek, about a third of the party that's kind of like MAGA light that could go for Vivek but could go for DeSantis, and a third of the party that want Haley. Yeah. And boy, I think we'd be having a lot more fun. If that was the part, if that was what was happening right now, rather than us having to stare down the fucking horror, you know, horror of Don a Donald Trump nomination. Um, but uh, I would we're not. That. And so, OK, yeah. so speaking of speaking of Haley, she's having her moment. Maybe it will last just today that uh, poll uh, out. I think it was the CNN poll, right, uh, that shows that uh, that that while while Biden is behind pretty much everybody, uh, that Haley yeah. is the strongest Republican candidate. So there are a lot of people. Some of the anti antis are going, hey, guys, you know, if you're Republicans, if you actually want to win, you should go with Haley. Haley is the most electable. And obviously, you know, you know, in the before times, electability would have been a real asset. Is it does it matter yeah. anymore? I mean, is her bump is, is her little moment going to I mean, how long is she going to have her moment? I just don't think it's going to ever amount to anything. I and mean, she, she has to survive enough to get to South Carolina. It's kind of like how, uh, you know, if you finish distant and then third what? in the first two. Yeah. And then what from there? So I, I mean, if you lose in South Carolina. So. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah I, I mean, I said in the age Snapchat, you know, one of the, my lines in this thing was I, it would be great if, you know, if, if, if we were staring down the barrel of a Haley Biden race and like the, the, then then the age issue, I feel like, would also wouldn't be as acute, right? Because it'd be like, okay, worst case scenario. But I, but I, so Haley, I would love for Haley to be the nominee. I probably wouldn't vote for her. Um, I certainly wouldn't vote for her, actually, um, given, you know, her Trump two-step is disqualifying for me. But, like, yeah. she's that she is that much better than the other ones. But it's just like, if I feel that way, that then... What does that say about what the mag the mega folks feel? They're yeah. not going to get there for her, and um, and so I just don't like I don't see where she goes from here. I think she's it's been encouraging, you know, for her team. Like her team feels buoyed, but but to well, me yeah. it feels like like that eventually you just run into the brick wall of the reality that Republican voters aren't, aren't looking for this. I mean, she's still, it's all of this like, Oh, this is so positive. You're still losing to Trump by 45. You're losing to him by 45. So Nothing's yeah, changed. I mean, she's up in the general, just one other thing on thought on the general, that general poll. It's true that, that on paper she would be, for, but if you just run this out, if if somehow Nikki won the nomination because Trump's in jail and she wins a delegate fight or whatever and they steal it from yeah. I, I don't know how she'd actually win. Yeah. Like doesn't Donald Trump Jr. run his third party? I just I, I don't Ooh. actually really know that that's true, right? Like I oh, think that man, I, I, yeah. I, I, aren't there a lot of other things that happen? Then I I, I just it find, I find it very that, hard that's to believe good, that that's, that Trump that, cult people just vote right. for. Her. Yeah, yeah it, there's there's it would it's kind of magical thinking to imagine that you're going to have a a, a a Nikki Joe Biden one on one. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, this is this is almost too boring to talk about. But Mike Pence gave a big <laughs> speech up in New Hampshire, um, and I actually had to write something about it. The speech at Saint Anselm's uh, College, which he clearly built, was billing as this is his major campaign reset. He called it, you know, a time for choosing, which is the famous Ronald Reagan speech from 1964, and he laid out the contrast between populism and conservatism. Have you have you read the speech? Because I uh -huh. I. Okay, so well, I haven't read the whole speech, but it's I, kind I of saw, an amazing. Clips. It, it, it's it's kind of an amazing document because I mean it's got the boilerplate attacks on the Biden administration. Set that aside. It's got a lot of you know the boilerplate nostalgia for Reagan. Set that aside. But then his critique of populism versus conservatism is really very very pointed. It's very blunt. He's got some very strong language there. In fact, there there are passages in there that could have been written by you know a never Trumper. 
which leads to, of course, the paradox of Mike Pence, because he said, this is the time for choosing for the Republican Party. This is the big choice. It's like, Mike, have you noticed the Republican Party has already made the choice and you were there standing by his side when they chose him? I mean, this is part of the problem. You know, how do you go from standing at, at Donald Trump's side for four years, supporting all of the anti-conservative populist policies, and then say, yes, but this is the existential threat that we face. We need to reject. There's not room in this party for populism and conservatism. You know, the, the whole fate of the nation, you know, hangs in the balance. If we don't reject this Trumpian populism, which I supported until five minutes ago, then we will cease to be the conservative party. We will be Republicans in name only. I mean, there's some really strong language in there that's hard to kind of reconcile with Mike Pence. So yeah, what do you I'm think? I'm excited to see yeah. your article on that. Yeah, I'm excited to see it's not an interesting like, one. When I saw that, um, when I saw that, um, I was like, these guys just don't want to accept the consequences of their own actions in supporting Trump. And I just listened and I chuckled to myself and it was, I, I had initial, my thought was initially exactly the same what you just said. It's like, we have a battle for the soul of the party right now. Yeah. It's like, no, man, we had that battle. Yeah. It was in 2016. I was on the field, actually. We, I, was on, I was on the side that you say you're on now. Yeah, yeah. I was like, char yeah. I was charging, you know, yeah. I was the front line, uh, you know, uh, uh, the yeah. light brigade, you know, charging to my death. Right. And and you were on the other side. You shot me, actually. You we Our side that you exactly. want, you know, lost already. It happened. Like, the battle's over. And and now you're kind of like running into the wreckage to extend this metaphor to death, right? Like Like running back in, being like, it's time to fight. And like yeah, there's dead right, bodies right. strewn around everywhere. It's like, sorry, bro. You were yeah, on the I wrong mean, side. I, I it's mean, over. I, I, the fight's over. Wh whoever wrote that for him, I mean, obviously I thought this was going to be the manifesto for restoring genuine conservative principles. But you read it and you go, this reads more like a eulogy because this party <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. It's like, right. and I had the same experience when I was talking in February, I, when I was, you know, had that, that, that event with Paul Ryan. And he's talking yeah. about what the conservative was like. It's not 2015 anymore. You know, there is a amount, there's a huge amount of denial about how this party has moved, what it actually cares about. And so Pence's critique of all the things that have been abandoned, you know, American leadership in the world, you know, concern about character, traditional values, all of that stuff. It's, it's true. But, you know, this time for choosing. No, they chose and they chose Donald Trump. They chose populism over conservatism, you know, and you ought to know that because you're sitting there as a former vice president of the United States at what, five to seven percent of the polls, which ought to tell you something. He managed to convince himself. It really is amazing. Like, you know, there there'll be psych could be psychological studies done about this for centuries, you know, just mm -hmm. like that he managed to. And there's so many people like him. He's just an avatar for this. He managed to sit in the Oval Office as the next in line to the presidency yeah and, and as the number one cheerleader for donald trump and yet still in his brain convinced himself that he hadn't really sold out his principles because he was still you know what i mean because he didn't but the he speech disagreed makes with donald it trump, he yeah. said so yeah he said so behind the scenes and he yeah. and you know and, he, and he's like actually you know we did the tax cuts that were very traditional like he convinced himself of that yeah. all that bullshit that he was spreading he he really did convince himself of it. There's this self delusion, and, and the yeah. fact that that self delusion is so powerful that it that it managed to persist even while being in the Trump White House. It's really it's like, remarkable. It's pretty remarkable. Well, and, it, and especially now that you read the Jinx. speech, where where he's basically they're sitting there, and he is describing himself as the polar opposite. That that and he says you know this yeah. time for choosing that they're irreconcilable. The differences are unbridgeable between populism and conservatism. And it's you were like, on the sign. You know, yeah, you were hey, on the wait, sign. Trump Pence. You're, you're sitting there in the same room. And, and now he's saying, yes, yes, we were partners and we accomplished a lot. And yet I represent a tradition that is completely incompatible with what Donald Trump is representing. And he's trying to kind of have it both ways. We accomplished a lot. And he's saying, you know, in 2016, Donald Trump promised to govern as a conservative, but he and his imitators are not promising that anymore. Well, where is your party going here? Um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a sad. Um, I, I'm debating your whether name's or not on the bumper sticker. Your name's on the Trump bumper Pence. sticker. It's right there. And when he I took like, the water bottle off the table, you 
took the water bottle off the table. I mean, you were like right there. <laughs> You know, it's broad shoulder leadership. I, like all this happened. I like, and, it, you know, it's almost like a multiple personality disorder. Like a me, myself and Irene type situation. Well, I, I, you know, part of me is like, glad you're coming around. Glad you're, you know, laying out sure. the distinctions. We have been <laughs> saying this for years now, um, you know, in opposition to people like you saying, this is not conservatism. This is a betrayal of all of this. And now you're coming around. Now you're seeing it. And like, welcome to the party, sort of. Eh, do you think one of these people, do you think there'll be a single person that well, when when Donald Trump accepts that nomination in Milwaukee is like, Charlie, you know, turns out you were right. <laughs> you were really right about that. Do oh, no, no, I get one. Actually, I get that all the time, but they never say that okay. in public. Then they go out and they do oh, something yeah. MAGA-like, and it's just like, okay, okay, this is like, this has become a cliche, what they say in private, what they say in public, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired of it. So, Tim, uh, we made it to the weekend. So thanks for, thanks for joining me again, and I hope that you have a great weekend. I'm planning to We're going to see you in Austin. We're going to be together in two weeks. Two weeks, we're going to be in Austin. Uh, Bill's going to be down there. Mona's going to be down there. Um, we have uh, panels, and then we actually have a meet and greet. So if you're down in Austin, you can, you know, just come in and say, come stop ahead. talking about this stuff. You know, we're, we're tired of you uh, talking about, this is what you should be talking about. You're, you're, say, yeah, you're saying things on your podcast that make us uncomfortable, <laughs> and we don't want that anymore. We were proud. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. So I will see you in two weeks. And thank you all for listening to uh, this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes with Tim Miller, and we will be back on Monday, and we will do this all over again.